Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the August Living with Disability Research Seminar. Um, I just want to start off with an acknowledgement of country. Um, La Trobe University pays our respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging, and will continue to incorporate the Indigenous knowledge systems and protocols as part of our ongoing strategic and operational business. So welcome to the seminar. And uh, we have two really good speakers this afternoon about a very important topic about access to quality health and mental health care for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, if you haven't joined us before, and there was a question in the Q&A already, which is a great sign, um, this session will be recorded, um, not the Q&A, but the, the, the two talks will be recorded and they'll be up on our uh, Living with Disability Research Centre website, um, maybe by the end of the week, maybe by early next week, along with the recordings from all the other seminars for the last couple of years, uh, which are now much more easily accessible through our website and through our, our YouTube channel, which James has been curating over the last little while. Um, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A and there'll be plenty of time when the speakers, uh, each speaker has finished uh, to have some discussion. So our first speaker this afternoon probably needs very little introduction to most of you. It's Professor Teresa Icono, who is based in Bendigo at the Rural Health School, but is a very important uh, executive member of the Living with Disability Research Centre, who's been working in the field of research for people with intellectual disabilities for almost her entire career, which is quite a long time. Um, and <laughs> this afternoon she's presenting, uh, her topic is increasing hospital access and quality of care for people with cognitive disabilities. And she's going to present um, some work that's in progress about translating a project that we finished a couple of years ago about quality health care, hospital care for people with cognitive disability, she's going to talk about the way that work's being translated into a whole heap of fantastic training materials. So over to you, Teresa. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so thanks for the chance to uh, talk about this project. Uh, as Chris said, it is a work in progress. Uh, and the title is Increasing Hospital Access and Quality of Care for People with Cognitive Disabilities. So obviously I'm presenting, but there are a team of us. So it's Chris, Jacinta Douglas, Joe Spong, who you'll be hearing next, and also our team, Anna Garcia Melga, William Crisp, and Charity Sims Jenkins. Now I'm going to, rather than start with the usual wordy introduction, start with the video. Hello, Cassie. You look so uncomfortable. Your sheet's been changed recently. I'll be back in a minute. Excuse me. With you in just a moment. Hi, how can I help? I'm Cassie's dad, and I just want some sheets so I can change her bed. She looks so uncomfortable, and the sheets look really grubby. Yeah, I can see that you're really worried about that. I can arrange for Cassie's bed to be changed. Don't worry. I'll need to do it, as there's no one here who seems to know how to move her. Yeah, I'm sure that you know the best way to do it because you're doing it all the time. So maybe you could show me, or we can do it together. That would be good. I just need to know that she'll be kept comfortable. She can't adjust the sheets herself. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so rather than unpack that just yet, I just want to tell you a little bit of the background uh, that Chris alluded to. So we completed a, a study, a proactive uh, study of, a prospective, <laughs> prospective study of hospital experiences of adults with cognitive disabilities. So pre people with intellectual disabilities or who had acquired brain injuries before they actually came into the hospital. So we had 60 adults, 50 with ID and 10 with ABI. Uh, and we had uh, both metropolitan and uh, a regional hospital involved. Uh, and the study uh, was conducted over 35 months in 
in total. And what we did was document 186 hospital encounters. So many of those people had multiple encounters. And their pathway was mostly through ED through to discharge. And we collected quite a lot of quantitative data uh, where we did medical audits, but also an enormous amount of qualitative data. And these came from interviews of patients. Uh, so we had 15 interviews of family. So we have 58 interviews of family, 20 interviews of disability support workers and 88 interviews of hospital staff. And there are also 107 direct observations done of the uh, patients with uh, cognitive disabilities during their hospital journey. So just to give you a feel for the quantitative results without going through all of them, because those results have been published. These 186 hospital encounters lasted from just a few hours to 364 days. So it was quite variable. Um, most came in via the ED with 62% staying in ED beyond a four hour benchmark, which is the benchmark that hospitals are meant to abide by. And I, I'm not gonna start talking about the current situation because that will take us off into a number of tangents. But surprisingly, um, in terms of that quantitative data, we had little to point to poor care in that um, oftentimes people who stayed in ED for longer than the four hours, it was because a number of um, assessment strategies were being, or assessment, assessments were being conducted uh, such that 76% received a clear diagnosis and 93% had a plan for post discharge. But still, we did see high rates of re-presentation. So 66% of those 186 hospital encounters were people coming back into ED or back into the hospital. And just over a quarter of them within, were within 72 hours, um, at least for the group with intellectual disability. And the 72 hours is important because internationally, that's considered to indicate a failed previous hospital experience or discharge process. So there were some, some problematic things that we needed to unpack. Our qualitative, uh, qualitative findings uh, suggested or indicated that you did get problematic practices when there was a failure to share knowledge and information uh, and little coordination of care across family or disability staff and hospital staff. And that could result in failed discharge, pros, discharge processes and extended hospital stays. But what we could document and what we were really trying to find out about was positive experiences. And, and we certainly were able to do that, but we found that they were implemented in quite an ad hoc manner. So with all that data, we thought, okay, how do we translate what we saw in that quite extensive um, data that we obtained uh, or translate them with the aim of systematically embedding those positive but ad hoc processes? So this is the process that we're involved in at the moment. Um, we're developing website resources that can be used for teaching in, in a flexible way. So, it's, so we're not conceptualising as conceptualizing as a training package where you go from A to Z, uh, but rather as a series of um, resources that you can use flexibly. Um, and we, we're structuring them around a framework that we felt captured the positive processes. So they're demonstrated through video clips based on what we saw. So what we wanted to be able to say to people is that, you know, these these solutions or these ways of working, which is probably a better way of thinking about it, uh, are not things that we invented. They're things that we saw or things that kind of needed a little bit of a move along to get to that resolution step. Um, and we, we're trying to explain what you see in those clips, like the one I showed you at the beginning, according to the relevant framework elements. Um, and we're creating pathways through our website specifically for hospital staff, for family or close others, or disability support staff. And we conceptualise the family and disability support staff as the people who often accompany a patient with cognitive disabilities, disabilities to hospital. 
So just to help you um, conceptualize this, so I've got my panel in the way of my slides. Um, so, so even though there's a separate pathway for hospital and disability staff and staff and family or close others, they all converge on the, the outcome that we're trying to achieve of quality hospital care. And there's a lot of overlap. It's more, the difference sits more in terms of pitching it particularly to those groups. So our framework for quality hospital care um, comprises four elements that we're trying to convey in terms of dynamic processes or parts that interact uh, rather than four steps to a good outcome. So um, the, the dynamic um, curves, <laughs> the organicness so that we're trying to portray in our logo is meant to show that this is um, you know, quite dynamic and it's not a stepped process. Um, and at the moment, I'm in uh, with the team, I'm in the process of trying to cull words. So if any of the team are watching this and going, that looks different to what we talked about before, it's because every time I look at it, I trim off a few words or I re refocus it or something. But anyway, just to go through um, those elements from the perspective of a hospital staff, it's what's the knowledge that you might need about people with cognitive disabilities or about the disability sector that will help sort of give you that background um, that's relevant in the situation when you're, um, when you're providing care to uh, a person with cognitive disabilities. And informing is that sharing of knowledge between individuals. So it's sharing information that's relevant about this person at this bit particular time. This particular time being perhaps when they come into ED, perhaps when they're being seen by a nurse or by a doctor within the ED um, uh, department itself uh, or later on the ward or in the discharge process. And collaborating is really that whole uh, process where um, you're collaborating with other hospital staff, with family and disability support staff, depending on who the accompanying people or person is, but always with the patient with cognitive disability at the centre. And supporting the patient and their relative or disability support worker in ways that accommodate the patient's needs. So through this process, you're um, enacting that support that's really needed by the individual. So we kind of repeat that whole thing for disability support staff, okay? So what do they need to know? They, they kind of know about the disability sector, um, you know, but they have different knowledge about uh, hospital processes. What do they need to share with hospital staff at, that, at a particular point? So not too much, but sufficient information. Um, you know, what's relevant right at that point. Again, the collaboration, but who they collaborate with could be hospital staff, but it also could be other disability support workers or family who may or may not be involved. And again, the focus is on supporting the patient by accommodating their needs. And then we do the same thing for family or close others. Um, so what do they need to know about hospital processes? And what information, what specific information do they need to provide about their family member, it might relate to their immediate health or medical um, concerns or presentations, or it could be about their medical history or about um, their personality or their personality or how they communicate, etc. And again, we've got the collaborating and the supporting. So before we watch Frank again, and Frank was the dad that you saw in that uh, video, I'll give you a bit of information. Cassie is Frank's daughter. She's nonverbal, but uses some signs and pictures to communicate. She's had many previous hospital experiences. She has trouble physically moving or adjusting her position or posture when in bed, and so needs help to reposition herself for comfort, but also to reduce the potential for choking. Frank's previous experiences of having to remain present and vigilant and to take on the caring tasks himself has caused him not to trust that hospital staff can or are willing to assist. So with that background in mind, let's have another look at that scene.
Hello, Cassie. You look so uncomfortable. Your sheet's been changed recently. I'll be back in a minute. Excuse me. With you in just a moment. Hi, how can I help? I'm Cassie's dad, and I just want some sheets so I can change her bed. She looks so uncomfortable, and the sheets look really grubby. Yeah, I can see that you're really worried about that. I can arrange for Cassie's bed to be changed. Don't worry. I'll need to do it, as there's no one here who seems to know how to move her. Yeah, I'm sure that you know the best way to do it because you're doing it all the time. So maybe you could show me, or we can do it together. That would be good. I just need to know that she'll be kept comfortable. She can't adjust the sheets herself. Yeah, fair enough. Now, um, if I was, if we were using these materials in a workshop, probably what I would have done is um, have a look at the video first, write down some thoughts and reactions, and then provide you with some background, and then frame it according to the framework, and then we would revisit it and unpack it that way. I'm not going to do that now. I'm not sure how many of them there are, but we can pick it up in the questions and answers if you like. Um, but I want to show you more of what we're doing. Oops. Okay, so um, what we're trying to do on the website, and I haven't, I haven't shown you or I'm not showing you the website because it, it's not fit for demonstration yet. It's still in a state of, um, it's still a work in progress uh, and still at the relatively early stages. But basically we're sort of trying to highlight, highlight parts of the, the framework. So parents or other family members who've been the main carer for a person can become frustrated when they feel that the person or their relative isn't receiving the best care. They've often had poor prior experiences and may feel that they are the only ones who know how to best support someone with cognitive disability. And this can translate in a hospital situation to being very um, impatient or to holding back frustration or anticipating the very worst, which can increase not only the, the relative's anxiety, but also the anxiety of the patient. Um, uh, and, you know, they've been providing the care and doing the advocating for the, the person, you know, the, their whole life. But in this scene, Glenn, who's the, the nurse, has kind of stepped back and sized up the information, the, um, the situation, and tried to reassure Frank by offering to do it. And then when she realizes that, you know, he doesn't trust that anyone else can do it, offers to collabor collaboratively work with him so that he can show her and then he can feel reassured that somebody is willing to learn and is there who can then take on that task. Whether he goes home and has a rest is another issue, but at least we've kind of diffused that, um, that issue, that concern. All right, so in the um, video scenes that we show, we take people along the hospital journey um, and we've got different participants with cognitive disabilities and people who in varying roles in relation to them. So we're not telling the story of Cassandra as she goes from woe to go, but we're trying to pose different scenarios with possible um, relevant others, if you like, so whether it's family or disability support workers. So here we have a scene from uh, Waiting in ED. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Excuse me, can you help? My son's getting really agitated. Could you look at his wound? I think it could be infected. You must have seen the nurse before me. Yeah, but we've been waiting a long time. You can't wait any longer. No, son. Are you his dad? Yeah, he's my son. Look, he cut his leg badly two days ago. Now, I took the bandage off before we came here, but I don't know, it doesn't look good to me. And I put a new bandage on, but he's still in pain. And, and these seats are really hard to sit in, and he hates all the noise here. Let's see if I can find a quieter place for him to wait and with a more comfortable chair. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. And you won't forget us, will you? Absolutely not. We have you on our list. One of us here will come in and check in on you and give you regular updates when we can. Thank you. All right. So in this scene, and there's lots of things we can say about the scene, but just sort of some, some 
kind of in your face types of things. Um, they've been waiting a long time. Uh, you don't know what's going on in the main part of ED. You don't know how many ambulances there are or if they're ramping or whatever. Um, but Quinn, who's the nurse, let Ray know that there was still going to be a long wait. Now, she's new to this situation. She obviously has taken over from whoever else was at the, the desk before. So she acknowledges Ray's concern. And, and in that way, she's supporting Ray. Um, and she acts on the information that he gives her. So he tells her, you know, that his son can't sit for any longer. Now, we don't know how long he's been sitting. It could have been a half an hour. It could have been three hours. We're hearing on the news that it can be eight or nine hours, you know. Um, but the thing is, it's very, it's a dynamic situation. You just don't know how much longer it's been. It's going to be. Um, so she responds calmly to his concern, but asks, uh, let, sorry, Ray let the nurse know about how he knows that Curtis is getting more distressed and, and knows, because she knows, he knows his son well, uh, it's increasing pain and discomfort. When, now what the nurse does is not necessarily say, we're going to put you somewhere else. She's acknowledged that this is an issue. She's been informed and she's going to try and do something about it. And the reason we, um, and one of the important messages I think in this resource is we're not really giving you a list of hospital staff or families or disability support workers a list of reasonable adjustments because the ability to implement any of those or the best solution for an individual is going to vary from situation to situation. So we're constantly trying to um, highlight the process rather than the specific strategies. Okay, so now we're going to repeat this scene, but we're going to have a different accompanying person. Mm -hmm. Look, we've been waiting about two hours. Is it possible you could just check his wound? You must have seen the nurse before I came on. Are you his dad? No, I'm his support worker. I was with him and it looked like his leg was really hurting him. He cut it badly two days ago. and I took the bandage off and I don't know, but it didn't look good. So I put another bandage on and we came here. It, it, he seems to be in more pain. I'm afraid they're still going to be quite a long wait. I'm so sorry. I don't think he's going to be able to wait much longer in this noise and in the chair. I think we can find a quieter place for him to wait with a more comfortable chair. Thanks, but you won't forget about us, though, will you? Absolutely not. We have you on our list. One of us there will come in and check in on you and give you regular updates when we can. Well, thank you. Hey, Kurt, it's still a bit of a okay. wait. It looks like we can go somewhere quieter. Thank you. Thank you. So just a few observations, and I'm sure you'll have your own. Um, but the knowing, so if, I, if I look at other parts of the framework, the knowing part about this from the perspective of uh, the disability support worker um, is that we kind of need to take on board that we all have different knowledge of emergency departments and how they operate. Um, and some of it's quite accurate and sometimes it's not or it varies from hospital to hospital. So the knowing part is that, although most, um, is that uh, the number of people in the waiting area doesn't necessarily reflect what's happening within the depart emergency department. Ambulance arrivals are not seen by people in the waiting areas and nurses need to judge the urgency of each patient's condition as part of the tri triage process. And after the initial triage, patients are seen according to the urgency of the medical health problem rather than the order in which uh, they arrive in the waiting area. And hospital staff, in terms of the knowledge that they need, um, relates to the fact that people with cognitive disabilities express things like pain and needs and distress in different ways. It may be through conversation. It may be that they stop conversing. It may be that they scream out and engage in some difficult behaviours. And in terms of informing, our message for disability support workers is their important role in explaining to hospital staff and sometimes re-explaining to new staff how the person indicates or communicates pain, discomfort or distress. And in this scene, Jono, the support worker, 
repeated information he may have given earlier, but this time for a new nurse at the counter. He explained to Quinn how he knew that Curtis was more distressed and the possible reasons, suggesting the noise and uncomfortable chairs. And that may be from previous experience with Curtis in a hospital or other situation. This information then let the nurse know that Curtis would need a quiet place to wait. And she also acted on Jono's concern about being forgotten. Well, if you move me to somewhere where you can't see me, will we get lost in the system? So she's able to reassure him that, no, that won't happen. And then he, in turn, can do the supporting of Curtis by, by reassuring him. And you can see, I hope, <laughs> hope you can see in that video how Jono's anxiety dissipates and he calms down and then he can more calmly support Curtis all right let's try another one with a different person with disability I'm Jess. you look brighter than last time I saw you yeah good to see how are you feeling? Oh, good. Hi, my name is Jenny. I'm one of the nurses. Oh, hey, Jenny. I'm Amelia. I'm just visiting Jeff. I haven't seen you around here before. No, I've been off duty for a couple of days, just back this morning. Seems you're ready to go home, Jeff. Yeah? I was just about to ring Jeff's home. The doctor thinks you're ready to go home, so we'll need to organise that. I'm going home now. You're doing well on the antibiotic medicine, and as long as you get your temperature checked every couple of hours, you can go home. But if it does get high, we'll have to organise for a blood test. Oh, no, yeah. That'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. But we just need to make sure we can take care of you properly at home. Look, I'm one of the support workers at Jeff's home. We don't have anyone that can monitor his temp or organise a blood test if he needs one. I see. Can't the nurse at his nursing home do that? Jeff doesn't live in a nursing home. He lives in a group home. We're not nurses. Really? Okay. Obviously, there's an error here. It says Jeff lives in a nursing home. In that case, we may need to delay this. Do you have time to tell me more about the supports in the home? I could look at options. That'd be great. And I can give you some information. If that's okay, Jeff. Okay. But you will need to ring the home and speak to the house supervisor. I'm right. See, hopefully today. But we just need to make sure you can get all the medical help you need first. So um, some of you may recognise the situation. Uh, often hospital staff do have incorrect information or inaccurate um, information about the patient's living situation or they don't understand the differences between a group home and a nursing home and supported living. Um, and they may think the patient has ready access to nursing or other medical care. And this misinformation could be in the records that they're accessing. Oops, sorry. Oh, no. Jeff. We don't really want to watch that again. Um, so Amelia wants to make sure that Jeff receives the health monitoring he needs when he returns home. So she she's in correcting the misinformation and in doing so, she's also advocating for Jeff's care. When Jenny, the nurse, finds out there'll not be a nurse or other staff trained to monitor his temperature and organise for a blood test, she postpones discharge so that she can look at appropriate ways to provide these in the home. And again, Amelia is able to reassure Jeff, although he's still really keen to go home and how successful she is with that, you know, may be questioned. But um, her, that concern about the appropriateness of where the person goes is one that is, uh, it occurred a lot in our data and we keep hearing about it in the media, you know, um, in terms of all the people sitting in hospitals waiting for a, appropriate accommodation to move to. So um, just to sort of give you an idea about the evaluation process that we're um, simultaneously going through so as we're building the website, um, we've had uh, stakeholder groups involved throughout. So people with intellectual disabilities, disability support workers, parents, hospital staff, and they've given us feedback about our scripts. Um, 
in interviews and in focus groups, all of which have had to be done by Zoom, but that seems to have worked fairly well. Um, we then did the videos, which was no small feat, especially with COVID and this constant fear that it got postponed many times. And I know everyone's experienced, everyone's got these stories, but anyway. Um, so once we had the videos, we've been showing them um, to our same stakeholder groups, not necessarily the same people, but wherever possible. Again, through interviews and focus groups. And when we finish the survey, sorry, the website, we'll then do surveys and interviews, giving people access to it and uh, asking them questions as they're moving through it and at the end, and then doing some interviews. Um, and just to give you a feel of the sort of feedback we've had, um, so video, and remember they're seeing videos without the context that I'm giving you. Um, so it's just have a look at this and tell us what you think. Is it engaging? Does it seem authentic? What do you think the message is? Um, so the sorts of things people say is the support worker is unrealistic. Support, support worker is a good advocate for the client's needs. The parents too full, full on unrealistic expectations, but parents need to be ready to advocate. And hospital staff in the main, in terms of our videos, listened well. The communication there was good involvement of the person with disability. On the other hand, there was poor involvement of the person. So there's a scene where Jeff is sleeping and it's not that clear to people watching it that they're not talking to him because he's asleep. And there is a scene where um, the hospital staff and the parent and support worker are talking over Cassie, even though she's asleep. Um, there's some criticism that, you know, the information sharing we're trying to highlight should have been passed on earlier. So that may relate to some contextual issues. I think it's around, uh, I should know, I won't guess, I'm not sure. There are things around what uh, people believe are technical inaccuracies. The doctor shouldn't be wearing long sleeves and ring. And yesterday I did a bit of a fact check and I went, actually, <laughs> that's not true. It depends on which part of um, the hospital they're in. Uh, the disability support worker would not change the bandage. Uh, Cassie's too supine, supine if she's or she's lying down too flat if she's at risk of choking. So there's lots of those sorts of things that um, you know I, may or may not be quite real. But you know what we now want to know once we've built the website and based on this feedback that we're receiving is once you put it into those contexts, what are the responses like? What do people understand about that dynamic process and how it can lead? to the support and good quality care. Um, and as positive an experience as anyone can have in hospital, given that usually when we're in hospital, we're not particularly well. And there is a lot of anxiety and you can't prevent that uh, because these are anxious times. So the website development continues. Um, one day I'll stop wordsmithing, but no time soon. Um, and just to give, just some credits. So Maytree is the company that lives, has um, engaged for many projects and they are amazing. Um, our wonderful actors, Callie, Jared and Robert, who played Cassie, Jeff and Curtis and had a great time and we had a great time with them. Extras, especially our friend Kate. Um, Joe, who was the building police <laughs> and helped make sure the environments that we was used as simulation spaces were um, available and we could reduce background noise as much as possible. Um, and I should mention that the funding agency is the National Disability Insurance Agency through an ILC mainstream capacity building grant. Any of you who are interested in um, the research that we based it on there the references and there's my contact so thank you the second half of this afternoon is uh the speaker is dr joe spong who is um in the school of public health at the latrobe in the she's a public health in the public <laughs> in the discipline of public health in the school in the latrobe rural health school again up based in bendigo um but is uh one of the core members of Living with Disability Research Centre as well. Um, so she's been, uh, she's a bit newer to di intellectual disability research than Teresa, um, but has been pursuing her interests around um, issues of the mental health workforce to support people with intellectual disabilities. So over to you, Joe. 
Thanks, Chris, um, and thanks for the opportunity to um, present at today's LID seminar. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a project that our team completed just prior to the COVID pandemic really hitting us. Um, and the focus of our project was um, about exploring the preparedness and training needs of a regional rural mental health workforce to support people with intellectual disability and mental ill health. But before I talk about the project, um, I would like to acknowledge my co-investigators, um, uh, Teresa Icona, who you just heard from, uh, Dr. Janelle Weiss, Professor Julian Troller, Tim Linton, uh, and Lisa Spong, and also just thank them for all the support that they've given me um, during this project. Also to mention that the project was funded by A La Trobe University Building Healthy Communities RFA um, Grant Ready Scheme. And also to mention, <laughs> I will get there, Chris, um, I'm going to try and get through this presentation without chattering because it is absolutely freezing here in Benigo. So in case you can't tell, um, so I'll do my best. Okay, so um, at the, the core of this project was um, really our knowledge that um, people with intellectual disability are considerably more vulnerable to the development of mental ill health than the general population. So at any point in time, um, around 20 to 40% of people with intellectual disability are believed to also um, be experiencing um, mental ill health. And that experience can be across the full range um, of mental health conditions. But also that people with intellectual disability have the right to comprehensive health care and equal access to mainstream health services and support, um, which is a right that's reported and supported in key international and national documents. So the vulnerability to um, the development of mental ill health um, largely arises from biopsychosocial factors um, and the relationship between these. So um, these can either serve to protect against or increase the risk of the development of mental ill health. So I'm just going to break these down a bit with some examples. Um, it's cold. Um, some biological, some possible biological risk factors um, could include things like um, polypharmacy, which is the use of multiple um, medications, which is not uncommon uh, for people with intellectual disability who um, may be experiencing comorbid conditions. Uh, a genetic predisposition to the development of mental ill health, um, having reduced physical activity, um, having poor diet. Both of these are related to um, poor quality of sleep, which can impact on daytime functioning. Um, some possible psychological risk factors could include things like uh, ineffective coping skills and ineffective coping strategies, um, difficulties with uh, emotional regulation, so feeling overwhelmed, having reduced self-esteem, reduced self-confidence, and some possible sociological risk factors could include factors which contribute to uh, the reduction of social engagement. So communication difficulties, um, having reduced social skills, reduced opportunities for meaningful employment, social isolation. Again, these are just some um, fact risk factors, but having a knowledge of the biopsychosocial factors um, and their relationship to mental health indicators is really important so that um, we can ensure um, that appropriate and correct treatment um, is provided and that it's not just the mental health indicator that's managed. So for example, um, the presentation of depressed mood may be related to um, a person having a change in their environment, um, a change in their routine, or their um, support workers may change, or that it could be related to um, an underlying physical health condition that requires further investigation and further management. Okay, so, um, Sorry. The higher rates of mental ill health for people with intellectual disability um, is not reflected in the rates um, related to accessing mental health support, which are lower for people with intellectual disability. 
So for people with intellectual disability, um, there's multiple barriers to accessing and receiving mental health support. Um, the recognition, the assessment, and the presentation of um, mental ill health for people with intellectual disability uh, can be complicated by um, the associated communication and cognitive deficits. So it might be really difficult um, for a person with uh, intellectual disability and the people who are supporting them to understand and express the mental health changes that they're experiencing. And what can happen um, when, uh, when there's difficulty with communicating these changes is that can result in atypical presentations of mental ill health. And that can be often through behavioural responses. Um, so again, this is really important um, information to be aware of and to be prepared for so that um, the attention and focus doesn't remain solely on um, the atypical presentation, but rather that there's an investigation um, of the factors that might be contributing to that atypical presentation so that they can also be addressed. Um, a lack of preparation and experience knowledge can also heighten um, the risk of diagnostic overshadowing. So this is where we see um, the mental health indicators being attributed to the intellectual disability. Now, these are just some barriers um, that people with intellectual disability may encounter, um, but the consequences are serious. There could be a delay in or under representation, sorry, under investigation or undiagnosed um, mental ill health, which could result in a worsening of the condition, exacerbated um, behaviours, um, possible uh, insufficient or inappropriate medications or treatments being prescribed. And for people who are living in regional or rural areas, um, there's even further risk um, for the possibility of more barriers being encountered. And this is related to um, limited access uh, and availability of health services, higher rates of intellectual disability. Um, and there's also a tendency for people who are living in these areas to underutilize um, public mental health services. And that's often related to things like um, stigma um, or concern about dual relationships, particularly in really small populated areas. So the Given um, the higher rates of mental ill health for people with intellectual disability, combined with all the barriers that they encounter in trying to access um, quality mental health um, support, we really need to have a prepared mental health workforce um, who can apply their skills and provide comprehensive mental health support to people with intellectual disability. And this might require making some adjustments to standard models of care within mainstream services. But, there's always but, um, the literature is showing that mainstream mental health staff are feeling inexperienced, underskilled, and lacking in confidence in knowing how to provide um, the support that's required for a person with intellectual disability and mental ill health. In 2018, there was a second uh, national roundtable on intellectual disability and mental health, which brought together about 130 experts in intellectual disability to uh, discuss and respond to the mental health needs of people with intellectual disability. And what resulted was a set of recommendations to these eight elements. Um, these eight elements um, came from the first national roundtable and a belief to represent an effective mental health system for people with intellectual disability. Within the eight elements is element six, um, which is workforce development and support. And that's where our project is situated. Um, one of the recommendations from this element is to upskill the mental health workforce to a minimum standard. Um, but before doing this, we really need to have a good understanding of their level of preparedness um, and their training needs, which can then inform approaches and uh, target areas that are requiring the upskilling. So we decided to follow a similar approach to 
our two co-investigators, Janelle and Julian, um, who conducted a survey study uh, to explore preparedness and training needs across the New South Wales public mental health workforce. But we wanted to um, do this for a regional rural public mental health workforce. Um, and we wanted to extend on their study by also collecting some qualitative data. So this is what we did. Um, we used email and newsletter invitations to invite all staff who are employed by a regional rural mental health service um, to participate in any of a survey, interview or forum. Um, and I'll just quickly mention that the mental health service offers both hospital and community services across the lifespan. So supports children through to older persons and responds to crisis right through to general case management. In terms of the survey, we used the survey um, that was used in the New South Wales study, um, made some adaptions, um, and we used this to collect information about um, staff demographics, uh, staff attitudes and confidence in supporting people with intellectual disability. We asked about education, professional development and experience. Um, we estimated that this would take about 20 minutes to complete. It was offered online or hard copy. We mostly used um, Likert scales to collect responses, but there was also some categorical and open-ended questions as well. We then used the interviews to further explore uh, the findings from the New South Wales study um, and to also explore the um, key preliminary findings that were coming through in our survey analyses. Um, and we asked about barriers and enablers, as well as um, resources that are provided or required to support um, people with intellectual disability. We asked about experience in delivering diagnostic and intervention services. Uh, and we also asked a bit more about education and professional development um, that had been completed. Um, and the interviews were conducted over the phone or in person. Um, and they went for about an hour. Then we had the forum um, and here was where we presented the preliminary survey and interview findings. And we asked um, forum participants to reflect and discuss these. And we also made some comparisons to the New South Wales study. And we asked participants um, as well for their opinions regarding future education and training. And we held this in person in a community-based location and that ran for an hour. Again, all pre-COVID, we didn't have to, it was, things were a bit easier to organize. Okay, so in terms of uh, the participants who responded to uh, the survey, uh, they were mostly female, mostly older than 25 years of age and from nursing, um, around half were employed full time. The majority were working in a clinical role um, with adult clients. We had a really nice balance of those who were working in community and hospital settings. Um, almost half had greater than 10 years experience as a mental health professional. Almost all um, reported contact with a person with intellectual disability professionally. And there was also a large portion who reported contact with a person with intellectual disability outside of their professional role. And these were really similar to um, the demographics observed um, for the New South Wales study. In terms of staff attitudes, um, we asked the participants to um, respond, to indicate their level of agreement um, to a set of statements and to do that by um, through a 10 point Likert scale where one equal degree right through to 10 equaling disagree. Um, and what I'm gonna do now is just show you a snapshot of some of the um, statements where we saw consistency in group responses. Um, so the consistent um, or the group response will be indicated by the median and the consistency will be indicated by these really tight um, interquartile ranges. We observed um, the consistent group responses for statements that were related to um, people with intellectual disability 
having the right to good mental health care and the right to the same access to services. To statements um, recognising that, um, that their role as a mental health professional includes supporting people with intellectual disability. And also um, to statements recognising that good mental health care impacts on the quality of life for a person with intellectual disability. Now, we also saw um, some group responses that fell mid-scale um, and had broader interquartile ranges. So um, this really indicates through the interquartile range that some people, some participants were agreeing and some people were disagreeing. So there was less consistency. And these were for statements um, related to resources and meeting the needs um, within the mainstream mental health service, um, communication regarding the staff member and the patient understanding each other, and um, to statements that I think are related to understanding um, whether the patient with intellectual disability may become more distressed and whether they would avoid or uh, have difficulty with undertaking procedures with people with intellectual disability. So just as a really short summary of the attitude uh, data, um, the, where we saw consistent group responses, these were really um, illustrative of um, positive attitudes by staff regarding people with intellectual disability, their right to receive quality mental health support and the consequences of this. Whereas the majority of statements um, that fell mid-scale um, and that were less consistent tended to be regarding the service um, and the staff skills regarding providing that support. In terms of staff confidence, um, we asked the participants to indicate their level of confidence regarding using core skills to support a person with intellectual disability compared to a person without intellectual disability. And they did this using a seven point uh, Likert scale from must, much less confident through to much more confident for a person with intellectual disability. And the three top areas where staff were least confident were for recognising when a patient may have a mental disorder, uh, understanding potential adverse effects of psychotropic medication and communicate, communicating effectively, so understanding and being understood. And these, again, were um, reflecting the findings from the New South Wales study. Regarding staff education and professional development, um, the majority reported receiving some um, training in the area of intellectual disability and mental health during their undergraduate education or as part of their uh, professional development. But very few, only two, um, reported that this was sufficient to meet their professional needs. And what's really interesting is um, the majority of the sample disagreed to um, a statement that, that said further training in working with people with intellectual disability was a low priority. And they reported that they felt that they would receive support from their manager um, to engage in further education. Many had considered um, professional development in this area, but only one person was doing so regularly. Again, just it was just reflecting the same or similar results to New South Wales. So we took these key findings, um, we wanted to explore them further. Um, so we conducted uh, interviews with seven participants. Uh, they were mostly female, um, older than 25 years of age, and mostly from the community setting, <clears throat> mostly from nursing, just over half had 10 years experience. From the interviews, there were two themes that were really coming through um, for us. The first one really spoke to system and service constraints. So this is where um, the staff, what we're seeing was that the staff were continuing to operate within their standard models of care and their standard operational procedures with little flexibility to account for the additional vulnerabilities of a person with intellectual disability, particularly regarding communication difficulties. And this was limiting and it was impacting on assessment 
and treatment. So there was insufficient time to collect all of the information that's required for what's considered a quality assessment. Um, if the patient has problems or difficulties with communication, um, there's a lack of collaboration and reach to other services like disability support services who might be able to provide um, some additional information about the person with intellectual disability to help the mental health professional get to know them better. And both of these things are having an impact on the mental health professional making a differential diagnosis. So if you think back to the confidence results, this relates to the first area of least confidence, recognising when a patient may have a mental disorder. So a quote here that um, supports this um, says, with someone with an intellectual disability, I mean, an hour would, for a lot of people, would be enough for them to sit in a room and complete that assessment. But you need, I guess, more time and resources. Um, the poor assessments were having uh, an impact on outcomes. And this is where um, we're seeing things are around treating symptoms only with this lack of exploration um, to investigate uh, factors that might have been contributing to those symptoms that they could also be explored and treated or managed. Or symptoms or side effects of medications um, were not being managed because uh, the, the person with intellectual disability um, had an inability to express about them. Um, so this ran the risk of inappropriate or insufficient medications or treatments being applied. So just another quote um, regarding this. She couldn't express that or couldn't describe her symptoms very well. And she unfortunately, she got sicker because of that. And yeah, so we needed to have more interactions with her. The system and the service constraints also having an impact on implementing reasonable adjustments, which seem to um, occur when the normal way of things hasn't worked. So they tend to be reactive rather than planned. Um, where adjustments were being tailored to the benefit of an individual, it didn't seem to, the practice of making adjustments didn't seem to extend to other patients who might also benefit from that. Um, they seem to be coordinated by individual uh, staff members um, who are working through and using their own skills to try and work through solutions. Um, and so it seemed to really stay at like a staff level. Um, a couple more supporting quotes. You know, we have ward routines and rules, for want of a better word, for a reason. And that can be a bit tricky to kind of work around that and yeah. They should be planned because to avoid being reactive. Because if you're reacting um, often, there's been some form of damage that's already been done. The other theme was in regards to solutions, but these solutions come with challenges. So the this, um, participating um, staff were really um, recognising that there is this need to upskill and engage in um, further education and this desire to do so, but um, doing so comes with their own challenges of, uh, in relation to time and opportunity to do so. So training really needs to be readily available. Um, also, the staff are in these generic positions. So they're, they're trying to support many people who have many um, types of mental health conditions. So upskilling in intellectual disability is competing against the opportunity to upskill in other areas of mental health. And there was this undertone that supporting people with intellectual disability might not be their core work. Um, and that this could influence um, which area they choose to upskill in. Um, so here's some quotes to support that. We get five days a year of professional development training. And as I was mentioning before, there's a lot of competing demands when you work as a, in a generic position. And we don't really get a lot of training around it because we don't see, there's not really a high proportion of people coming through with an intellectual disability. So with the um, challenges of time and opportunity comes this greater reliance on others for support. And, it was really acknowledged um, that 
people who know uh, the person with intellectual disability well, like family members, are a valuable source of support. Um, but at the same time, there was this recognition that family members might be tired or burnt out and in need of respite. Um, so the, there's this feeling of just being attentive as to whether the best interests of the person with intellectual disability are being expressed. There's also this desire to um, seek and receive support from experts um, in intellectual disability and mental ill health, but knowing who they are or if they still exist or if they're available was really limited. Um, and the psychiatrists are there as well to offer some support, but um, they might not be uh, experts in intellectual disability. So discussions from the forum, we had approximately seven um, participants attend, really supported our findings that there is this need for longitudinal assessment processes and other adjustments and a need to focus on differential diagnosis of intellectual disability, mental illness and other components, which uh, those two bullet points really um, relate to each other, I think. Um, and this recognition of the need for further education and professional development, but upskilling is really difficult due to other demands. So in reflection um, of the findings um, regarding the system and the service constraints that staff are working within and the difficulties with that are associated with upskilling and thoughts about future direction, um, what was coming through was this need for co uh, collaboration, this need for collaborative problem solving and support of patients with intellectual disability, um, really about getting to know the, uh, the patient to inform all the team members who can then work together um, better towards person-centered solutions. And then in considering future training and development, um, collaboration still really remained the focus with sort of this emphasis on all staff across all areas engaging in further education and development, which would suggest that there does need to be um, some consideration about maybe moving away from these traditional approaches um, that involve individual learning styles, where the individual has to um, develop their own expertise to be able to you know, problem solve and um, work through underlying problems and rather to um, consider engaging in uh, collaborative learning approaches. So sharing expertise, problem identification and responsibility for implementing supports and treatments uh, to address each patient specific needs. So even though I'm showing a reference list um, and that this is where um, talking about this project ends, I do just want to take the opportunity to um, mention that when we're considering um, preparedness for the mental health workforce in providing access to quality mental health support to people with intellectual disability and mental health, um, we, we need to consider not just upskilling the current mental health professionals, but we have to be mindful of our future mental health workforce as well. So there's a lot of evidence in the literature, um, support, which is supported by the findings of this study, um, that there's a perception from mental health staff that there's insufficient education um, for, to meet their professional needs in their undergraduate education. So enhancing cognitive disability health um, content within the curriculum and also within continued professional development has been a focus um, of the Royal Commission um, and there's been a set of recommendations that have been generated and the reason why I just I wanted to mention that was just to highlight that um, this is an area that's still in focus um, so I'm really hopeful that you know we're going to start hearing about um, mental health workforces that feel more confident and more prepared in supporting people with intellectual disability. And it's just really good timing too Chris because someone's outside with a leaf blower um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming out.